further ado, I would like to get this cooking class started. My name is Erin Wygant. I work for the San Juan Islands Visitors Bureau. And thank you so much for participating in our virtual Savor the San Juans. This is our 13th year of Savor the San Juans, which is a fall celebration of food, farms, and film. All throughout the month of October, we're bringing you these virtual events. We so wish that these tours and cooking classes could be in person, but we are so excited that you're joining us here on Zoom. I would really, I'm thrilled to introduce our baker for this evening. Uh, this is Amanda Zimlick of Otters Pond B&B. Thanks for having us. Hi, thank you for having me, Erin. And thanks again for, uh, for allowing us to be a part of this event. It's really fun for me. Um, I'm fairly new to innkeeping and fairly new to the San Juan Visitors Bureau. So uh, um, it's quite an honor to do this. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope this will be fun and, and uh, somewhat interactive. We'll do some questions at the end um, too, because I know as we start getting, getting going here, all kinds of questions pop into our minds about what's going on. So um, definitely write them down if you think of anything during the video or during the demo that uh, you'd like to ask at the end and be more than happy to, uh, to spend some time answering those questions. So. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So what I thought would make a lot of sense today would be to do a demo on scones. And this is funny to anybody that knows me over a long period of time because they know me as a cook and as a chef and not as a baker. <laughs> Baking is not my forte, although uh, as an innkeeper, it certainly is something that I do every day now and something that I've really grown to love um, because I think for the most part, it's the first part that starts people's day. It's the breakfast, it's the pastry, it's the sweet, it's the thing that you have with your tea or your coffee, uh, depending on what, uh, what kind of morning beverage you enjoy. And, you know, trying to find those pastries that, uh, and those baked items that go along with all kinds of beverages and, and uh, most people like, that's really the, the sweet spot for innkeepers. We want to find something that makes most people happy. So this recipe is actually something that's evolved over time. I started with the really traditional um, and a great scone recipe from the New York Times that it had butter, it had flour, it had several other ingredients in it, it had eggs in it, um, which I'd be happy to use. I, I have hens that lay eggs and so I like to use those eggs as much as possible, but so many ingredients, the recipe got really complicated. So me being kind of lazy, going back to me telling you that people who know me kind of laughed at the fact that I'm doing a baking demo. Um, I, I'm not a baker by training. I, I, I was a chef for a number of years in restaurants and, and in uh, product development. I led product development teams for, for large corporate companies. So, so doing this is, is kind of fun. But what I've tried to do is condense it into a really simple recipe a handful of ingredients and something where you can just swap in an ingredient. Uh, if you don't want to do chocolate chips, which is the flavoring in this particular one, you can do anything. You can even make the savory. So in the recipe, um, which this is kind of funny. So this is going to be backwards. It's going to be, <laughs> you're going to see this whole thing backwards, but if you wanted to take a snapshot of this um, on your computer, you can, and then you can invert, you can reverse it so that it comes out. But basically what you're going to want is, about three cups of flour. This is gonna be for six medium-sized scones. So three cups of flour um, by volume. You're gonna do about two cups of cream. Now this is a very important ingredient. We'll come back to this. This is 40% heavy cream and it's ice cold. It's very, very cold, that's important. Um, I've got a cup of my mix-in ingredient, which is chocolate chips in this case. This is the thing that you can swap out other ingredients for. So if you wanna do a savory one with cheddar cheese and ham and scallions, Yum, yum, that's really, really good. You can take the chocolate chips, do away with them, and then sub in your, your percentages of cheese and ham. If you're a really cheesy family, then a cup of cheese and half a cup of ham will do the trick. Um, reverse it if you're a meaty family. So you can kind of play around with this recipe. Other ingredients that are really important, sea salt. I use sea salt because it will stay somewhat crystallized in the mix as it bakes. It doesn't completely dissolve all the way out. If you want it to dissolve and you don't want to have any crystallization left in your baked good, and you don't want to have a little salty zing or bite, then you're going to want to use kosher salt. So kosher salt would be a perfectly good substitute. I wouldn't advise using table salt. 
uh, table salt tends to have that iodine uh, lingering flavor and sometimes will counteract with some of the other things that we use in, in the scone. Um, I just don't think it tastes as good, but that's a personal preference. So um, you, can, you can mess around with the formula if you like. This is baking powder. You need a tablespoon of baking powder. That's going to be your leavening agent. It's going to react and help this scone be light and fluffy and delicious. So they're very important. They do not turn out <laughs> if you forget this baking powder. So this is very important. And then um, I have an optional ingredient. I like to use the sanding sugar. And I don't know if you've ever seen this stuff, but if you get sugar in the raw packets, those work really well too. Basically, it's a large crystal of sugar that you can put on the top of your baked item, whether it be a muffin or in this case our scones, and it doesn't melt completely. So you get a little bit of that shiny, looks like magic fairy dust or snow on the top of your of your uh, pastry. And that's really nice um, as a textural element too. So I use that sanding sugar, but sugar in the raw works really well too. And let's see, did I forget anything? I don't think so. So without uh, any more yada 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 yapping, I'll go ahead and get us started. So first thing I have here is a very large stainless steel mixing bowl. And the reason why I like this large mixing bowl is because it allows me to have a lot of room to mix and, and to, to work in. So if you don't have a really large mixing bowl, um, I advise that you, you find some way to uh, you know, work in a larger, larger space. So if you have to do it on a countertop, you can. It's just a little bit more messy. So maybe you want to use a piece of parchment paper underneath your work surface. That works perfectly fine. So while I'm doing this, I've got my oven set to 400 degrees um, on convection, and I use a, um, a Silpat mat on a baking tray. And the Silpat mat allows the bottoms of my scones to not get too dark. If you cook on a parchment paper, you will have a little bit of a different bottom. So this is your parchment paper. Uh, cream has protein in it and cream browns when you, when you bake it in an oven. So, Mary Berry would tell you that this is a brown bottom. We don't want our bottoms too brown. This is one baked on a silpat. Notice it's a lot less brown. And this is the desired result that we're going for. So the top is brown. The bottom is lightly brown. This is parchment paper. Still a really nice high quality sheet pan, but because that conduction happens uh, more aggressively, you get a darker bottom. So Mary Berry would tell you silpat. That's, that's the lesson number one there. Okay, so into our bowl, we're going to do our dry ingredients. The fairly simple procedure, so this is gonna be mixing all the dry ingredients, adding in the cream, and then we're going to um, mix and cut and do our shaping. So flour is first. Always start with the biggest ingredient. The next ingredient we're gonna put in there is gonna be our salt, followed by our baking powder. We're not gonna add our sanding sugar yet, because remember, that's gonna be for our finishing. So baking powder, salt, flour, that's what's in the bowl. Then we're gonna add our chocolate chips. If you're doing a savory scone like cheddar and ham, or if you're doing um, cranberry almond, or uh, another one that my guests really, really like is an orange anise scone, you would add those ingredients in at this point. For the orange anise scone, you don't have a cup of something, but you can add in a couple tablespoons of anise seed, which gives it that kind of licorice fennel flavor, and then some orange zest and a squeeze of the orange in when you add your liquid, your cream. So I just kind of mix this with my hand. I'm not really, I'm not really uh, a spoon user, but if you need to, you can use a spoon. Stir your ingredients together. That's perfectly acceptable. So I've got everything kind of distributed evenly there. That's really important because as we add our cream in, the cream's going to basically solidify everything into the mass. Now, the cream, I told you I was going to come back to this really important ingredient. This is ice cold 40% cream. And the reason why I'm using 40% cream is that higher butter fat is like, this stuff is like liquid butter. I use it in everything. I love it. It's my favorite cooking shortcut. Uh, it's like Bobby Flay uses chive oil. I use 40% cream. <laughs> and this is the shortcut of not using butter because if we were to use butter in a pastry, we would have to cut in the butter. We'd either grate it on a box grater and mix in the butter so that it stays in nice little piece-sized pieces, or we would cut it into small pieces and cut it in with butter knives. That takes a lot of time, and at six o'clock before I've had my coffee, I'm not really all keen on doing all that stuff. So I like to make it really easy and pour in my butter. So what I'm gonna do is just pour this cream in. 
right on top of my dry mixture. And I'm going to reserve a little bit, so don't dump it all in. Leave yourself a little bit. Depending on the hydration of your flour, which all-purpose flour you use, sometimes you're not going to need all that cream. So, um, and I kind of make a claw with my hands. It's going to get a little messy, folks, sorry. And I'm just going to kind of mix in that cream until I get this really nice blob going on here. There we go. Now we've got, you can see it kind of coming together. Now the, the idea here to a light cream scone is that it's going to be, the, the less kneading you do and the more just kind of getting the flour to stick together, that's the idea. So if you think I'm just doing this to get the flour to stick together, I'm not trying to knead this into a, a sticky mass, that's going to give you the desired result. We don't want pizza dough. We want a light, fluffy biscuit that's barely stuck together. And while I'm doing this, I'll tell you one factoid. So scones actually originated in Scotland in the 1500s, and it used to be a biscuit that was made out of oats that you cook on a grill. And somehow it's evolved into this breakfast pastry. And I'm sure it's been bastardized enough that by the time I got my hands on it, it's nothing like the original. But what I like about this is it can also be a base for dessert. So if you want to do a strawberry shortcake for summer, um, I use this scone as a base and I just do it with buttermilk instead of the cream and it's actually really lovely. Okay, so I've got my mix here. <clears throat> I've got kind of a nice disc going on that. See that? It's still a little loose. That's okay. If I really want to get all the little remnants out of the bowl, I can pour a little bit more of that cream in there, work it in and kind of stick it together. But in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap my bowl out for my sheet pan. This is my sheet pan with my parchment. And I'm going to shape this blob into a disc about two inches high. You want it to be a little bit lower than the finished height of the scone. And that is going to be a nice, easy way to freeform these. Now, if you wanted to do this and have perfectly rounded shapes, you could take a biscuit cutter or a cookie cutter or a glass if you're really barbaric. And you would just cut those into round or whatever shape you were looking for. But I like this because I, it's minimal work. It's just a couple of, couple of uh, cuts. Okay, so now I've got my disc, right? So there's my scone disc. It's not perfect, but rustic is beautiful. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna brush the top of this with some of that residual cream that I have from my two cups that I started with. And I'm just gonna kind of brush this on Nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. When I'm really in a rush in the morning, I just use my hand. <laughs> but because we're doing this, I'm trying to be a little bit professional about this. All right. And once I get this all kind of brushed, this is going to give a nice little crispy brown layer to the top of the scone. Once I get this all nice and covered, I am going to do a little sprinkle dinkle of my sparkling sugar. So this sugar is just going to go liberally on top. Nice smattering. Some of it will melt and some of it will stay crunchy and glittery. And that's really nice. And again, you can use your um, sugar in the raw if you want to, or you can just forget it all together. If you're doing a savory scone, you could do sesame seeds, you can do poppy seeds, you can do sunflower seeds. A lot of really cool stuff that you can, you can play around with. Um, sometimes I'll do a blueberry scone and I'll do a little orange zest inside and then I might do a little sesame on the top and that contrast of sweet and savory is really, really good. Um, especially if you're pairing it with a specific tea or if you want some different layers of flavor happening there. So, so that's the disc. Now we've got our cream, we've got our sugar. The next part is cutting this. So in the end, um, because I like to give people a pastry that they can either have with their tea in addition to their entree or they might want to take it with them on a hike after their breakfast, um, I will give them the option of taking it at a, a to-go container. So I actually make a pretty nice size scone. But, you know, math-wise, you can cut this eight ways pretty easily, or you can cut it six ways. I'm going to cut it six because I like that size. So my first cut's going to be like this, and the second cut is going to be like this. And then we will go right down the middle of those two, and now we have six even pieces. So once we have these six even pieces, you want to space them on your pan so that 
you're get, allowing enough space for them to kind of melt as they bake and move apart. <clears throat> and so what I do is kind of go opposites. Oops, sliding down there. But you can kind of get the get the idea. Two wedges facing each other, and then the others opposite. And this will allow them as they bake to kind of come out. So, so that is the basic scone recipe. Again, you can mix and match flavors. If you're doing a, a different liquid flavor, like the orange and yeast scones, you would just add in a couple tablespoons of that orange. Don't take out any flour. Leave that three cups of flour ratio in there with the two cups of, of cream. That's, that's a good ratio. And then the two uh, tablespoons of anise seed um, instead of the whole cup of chocolate chips. You just have a slightly smaller scone, but it's really uh, a minimal difference. So that's the, the basic recipe. I'm going to bake these at 400, about 20 minutes, 22 minutes in some people's oven. Convection is really important. And also baking this in the middle of the oven is also very important. If you bake it too high in the oven, it's going to brown on top too quickly. And then you're going to have overbaked on the top, underbaked underneath. If you bake it on the bottom of the oven, you saw my Mary Berry uh, outcast scone there with the dark bottom. That was no, no bueno. So you want to have something kind of nice convection around that pan. Don't have anything underneath the oven, uh, underneath it in the oven when you're baking them if you want perfect results. So I will go ahead and put these in the oven and then Aaron's going to play a short video for you. And then when we return, we will uh, do a little Q and A. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the inn and some of the other projects we've got going on. All right, enjoy. Wow. Thanks so much, Amanda. That was so fun. I am thoroughly covered in <laughs> ingredients. Um, as everyone else puts their dishes and their scones into the oven, we are going to take a tour of Otter's Pond B&B. It's a beautiful B&B right outside Moran State Park on Orcas Island. And so we're going to go there now. We're going to get to tour some of the rooms and an experience where we are virtually baking with Amanda right now. I'm Amanda Zimlick, and most people know me as Chef Amanda, and I'm the chef, innkeeper, and owner of Otter's Pond Bed and Breakfast here on Orcas Island. I grew up in Seattle, and I came to Orcas Island last year. I bought the property in April, and we have been um, loving it ever since, meeting all my guests and having a lot of fun with it. I started with some chickens. I started with four Rhode Island red chickens and I've grown my, my flock of chickens that lay eggs for the inn. So that's been really fun. And guests like to go out there and visit them and feed their leftover blueberries to the birds as well. Um, and of course our main feature, Beautiful Waters Pond, is right here off the deck. So guests get to come and eat uh, in the dining room. They can eat out on the deck when the weather's nice today, not so much, but um, it's just a really nice, flexible format. When I first um, came across Otter's Pond, I, I knew that this would be an amazing area for birders and for people that were uh, avian enthusiasts, uh, as I am. I don't know a lot about birds, but I'm learning it now that I'm here. I knew being in close proximity to, to Marin State Park, this was going to be an awesome place. What I didn't know is the vast uh, you know, spread of different varieties of birds. We've got over 100 species that visit the pond, so people come from all over the country and all over the world when, when travel allows uh, to come here and to photograph and just observe the different birds during different seasons. So the feeders off the deck are a really exciting feature for guests to sit down and enjoy a glass of wine or have their coffee in the morning and just listen and, and, and watch all of the different chirping and, and eating and activity out there by the feeders. My real mission, I think, with this is to kind of turn the traditional bed and breakfast on its head a little bit. Now that we've gone through this COVID time, not do the standard, you know, everybody sits at a long table and eats together, but we have lots of different tables spread throughout the inn, which gives people a chance to mingle a little bit, but, but also have their unique private dining experience, which I'm all about. So it's been a lot of fun. Yay! Thanks, Amanda. Um, so that was just sort of an overview tour of Otter's Pond B&B. Um, we are 
welcome to take questions at this time. You can either use the chat function in Zoom or unmute yourselves and ask your question directly to Amanda. Uh, we also have a separate room tour we can take in a little bit if, if you'd like as well. There's scones out of the oven as well. Hey, look at that. Woo! Yeah, right? The magic. <laughs> 20 minutes fast forward. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Okay, I, I did it right along with you. I had everything set. But when I put my, my uh, dough on the tray, uh -huh. it was more runny. Oh. So when I cut it, when I cut it, it didn't cut into nice pieces. I had to like kind of reshape it. What did I do wrong? You, you were on the right track. It's probably just a matter of maybe a, a few more folds, just mixing it just a little bit more. Also, the temperature of the cream really has something to do with it. So if you had um, slightly warmer cream, yeah, kind of conceal it quickly. Um, okay. The butter fat will, will make a difference. So the 40% cream, um, I buy the Dairy Gold stuff at Costco, not trying to do a big uh, branded plug <laughs> in my, like I would in my former career, but um, that 40% dairy gold, let me see if I can grab some. It's, um, this, is the, this is the liquid butter. So it really does say 40% on, on the container and this makes a difference. It's gonna be thicker. It's gonna be- I got a little one, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, you might have, typically in the grocery store, you'll see a 30% or 36% and that's still okay. good. And it'll still work, but you may want to go with a little less and hence, you know, then you wouldn't have as much of the runny. But that's, I think that's what I should have done, put a little less. Okay, but mine are in the oven, so thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope this turned out. I hope you enjoy them. I will. The dough is great. I'm licking it off my fingers. It's really good. <laughs> good. Um, Amanda, we've got some questions coming in from the chat room. Uh, we've got, what if you don't have a convection oven? That's no big deal. Um, the convection just kind of helps circulate that hot air, but as long as you're putting that pan in the middle of the oven, that should work just fine. You may, wanna, you may want to um, raise the temperature a little bit, 415, 425, um, experiment around with just a slightly higher temperature. When you use convection, you would actually bring the temperature down. So 400 is calculated to account for the convection. So without it, maybe try 415, 425. But that's a really good question. Yeah, we've got one more. Um, if using berries, would you use one full cup of berries or what's the berry ratio? I say use as much berries as you like. I'm a, I'm a berry person, so I would even go maybe a cup and a half. It's really how much you want um, in that scone. So if you want it just kind of falling apart and exploding with, let's say we're using blueberries, you know, you can try to cram two cups of blueberries in there and probably be successful with it. It just kind of depends on the size of the berry. Um, smaller ones are easier to get more of them in there. So if you're doing like currants. Um, on the dried fruits, I should say this, on the dried fruits, if you're using currants, raisins, anything that can tend to be on the drier side, even dried cranberries sometimes when they've been sitting a while, they get really dry. So you may want to plump them in a little booze. You may want to um, soak them in a little, you know, brandy or, you know, rum or whatever your, whatever your, your baking booze of choice is. That adds a nice flavor development too to it. And of course the alcohol bakes out when you're baking the, the pastry. So not to worry, you won't get, you won't get tipsy off your scones. <laughs> We've got another question. Can you use tur turbiano, turbinado sugar on top? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, uh, turbinado sugar is uh, another um, fancy way of saying another kind of a raw, lesser processed sugar. And so it's kind of brown in color, usually a larger granule size. So it does bake really nicely on the top of pastries and it gives you just an even more um, deep flavor. Um, so yeah, if you can find turbinado sugar, fantastic. Try it. Uh, we have someone else saying, I just discovered you. Will you do more shows? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know, Erin. Are we going to do some more of these? <laughs> I think we should. My kitchen has never smelled so good. I think, uh, Diane, to answer your question, we are going to do these virtual baking classes all throughout October. So today we've got scone baking. On Wednesday, we're going to be making pound cake with the Eden Wild Inn on Lopez Island. And then on Friday, we're going to be making handmade pasta with Coho Restaurant here in Friday Harbor. So we have two more opportunities to do a virtual baking class, cooking class in the San Juans. But I think we should do more of these. As long as we're all in quarantine, might as well. Sounds great. Sounds awesome. Can I comment? Absolutely. Okay. Um, 
So, hi, Amanda. Hi, I have to admit, I thought this was Friday, so I got all set up and ready to rock and roll on Friday. Oh, and, no. Um, but that's okay. So, I made them. Oh, And good. off of the email that I got... And it was really soupy. Like, I don't know if this gal um, who was talking earlier about it didn't really come together that great. Um, it, she may have followed the recipe uh, in the email because it called for three cups of cream. And oh. mine turned out at like a big fat pancake. Oh no, so, yeah. So gooey. yeah. And so tonight you only use two and this is a very different scone in my oven than the one I did on Friday. So she may be following a re the recipe that I got off the email. Just oh, FYI. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're sorry about that. So yeah, it, no worries. three cups of flour. Typically, you'll only want to use about two cups of liquid. This will work for a biscuit as well. So if you decide to make a biscuit, um, you know, again, with using that, that handy dandy. Yeah. <laughs> higher uh, fat percentage and really cold, cold cream is important. That will help, um, you know, and, and as you're mixing it, you really want to give it a good mix. It's really kind of a feel by mix thing, but um, the, you're, every time you're folding it and mixing it, you're developing gluten. There's two proteins in gluten, glutenin and gliadin. And every time you're mixing and activating that protein, you're making it stiffer. So that the magic behind really good pastries is not too much but enough to get that to come together. And that's really, um, I think the, the best way to do it is just to practice it. So I apologize for, for the soupy. <laughs> it was fun. I was, I had some nice wine and I was cooking by myself. <laughs> like, but, and now I, now I've, I'm excited about the scones in the oven now. Awesome. It's great awesome. to see you. <laughs> We've got a question in the chat room asking, can you remind us how long they need to be in the oven? Yes, it usually will take, if you, if you do 400 uh, convection, you usually take about 20 minutes. Um, I keep an eye on them. Every oven is a little bit different. You may even want to rotate the pan midway through baking, and that will just ensure some even browning. If you don't have convection, that's another really good thing to note, that you'd want to rotate them at least once, and you want to make sure that they're in the middle so that they're not too high getting brown on the top and not too low getting brown on the bottom, too brown on the bottom. So keep them in the middle, rotate them, just kind of common sense around just getting that even browning going on. And then check them. When you, when you touch them in the oven and you push on them to see if they're done and they're still obviously raw in the middle, they need a little bit more time even if they're starting to brown. So just lower the temp a little bit, leave them in the oven, let them finish baking and they should come out beautiful. We have a, a question coming in asking, can you freeze the cream to use later if you buy the large Costco version of the cream? You can. And actually, this stuff has a really good shelf life. So um, you buy it at Costco, you got about a month and a half. You can also use cream beyond its uh, expiration date. It, because of the high butterfat content, there's lower moisture in there, there's lower water, and therefore it will turn slower. When you bake with a sour cream, it's not a bad thing. It actually adds a little bit of flavor to your cream. So as long as you don't have any mold or anything like that happening on the surface, which you wouldn't in a homogenized product, um, you should be you should be good on that. But yes, you can freeze it. When you thaw that cream and you use it for baking, you may want to give it a little stir. You don't want to whisk it because then you would have whipped cream, but you do want to maybe just give it a stir in case there's any synergies or separation from the water to the butter fat, just to kind of get it even proportion of that as you mix it into your baking. But it works very well. Great question. We've got a, another question from Diane asking, can we use this for Irish soda bread? Yeah, um, you know, it's not too far off Irish soda bread. Um, you're going to obviously have a little bit of a different leavening situation in the Irish soda bread. You're going to actually use baking soda and baking powder in most Irish uh, soda bread, so you're going to have more leavening. It's a different, slightly different recipe, but you could, you could experiment with your own sort of hybrid of those, of those and, and you can even bake it in a, pan, in a tin if you'd like to. But, um, but yeah, this again is really good as a biscuit, it's really good as a scone. You can do different shapes and definitely mix in different ingredients. I have a more general question. It's, uh, you will have a B&B. &B. Can you tell a little bit more about that? 
Sure, yeah. So this is a, uh, a bed and breakfast on Orcas Island. It actually uh, was started many years ago, about 18 years ago. Um, and I bought the property a year ago, last April. And um, we have five suites here uh, at the B&B. Each suite has its own bathroom. Each suite is a little different, uh, differently appointed. It's a modern buildings, kind of arts and crafts, kind of, um, you know, uh, country chic Northwest, a little, a little hodgepodge of all as far as style goes. But um, the main idea is having a lot of peace and quiet, tranquility. And we're located right at the edge of Otter's Pond on Orcas Island, which is situated right next to Moran State Park. So we're part of the same um, the same ecosystem, the same water system, uh, waterway as uh, Cascade Lake in, in Moran State Park. It's a ground fed spring pond and so it stays full year round and we have tons of birds, tons of beautiful uh, lily pads and uh, iris, uh, wild iris growing on the pond. It's just a really beautiful place to spend each season. Um, and so our guests will have their suites facing the pond. They can sit out and drink their coffee and tea and enjoy the scenery, reading a book, relaxing, and then also just be a hop, hop skip and a jump from all of the island activities like kayaking and cycling and hiking on the island. So it's just a really good jumping off point, but I'm really glad that you asked about that. And uh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say Otter's Pond is a really beautiful b, &B and we can take a quick room tour right now while everyone's is baked. Does that sound okay? Otter's Pond is a five suite bed and breakfast and each of the suites has a, a little bit of a different view of the pond. I've got um, three suites on this side of the building so they're all facing over the pond. The one upstairs is called Swan Room. That's uh, a king size suite and it's got a large master bathroom and it has I think in my opinion the prettiest view of the pond uh, overlooking the, the back side of it. And then I've got Bluebird Room, which is on this side of the pond, on this side of the building, and it also overlooks the pond, um, so you can see kind of around the, around some of the trees over here. So in the winter time, we have trumpeter swans that come and visit us in uh, December and January and February. You can actually see them from from your bedroom window, which is really neat. And then downstairs we have Chickadee Room, which is right over here, opposite the kitchen, um, and it's also got a nice private uh, in-suite bathroom and it overlooks the pond and this mossy rock formation that we have outside looking uh, just beyond the deck and sometimes you get visitors from a black-tailed deer which is really neat uh, for folks staying here that don't normally get to see that sort of thing and then we have our largest suite off the front porch that has its own entrance which is a king-size room and it's got a gas fireplace it's very nicely lit and very romantic it's got a nice little sitting area too so Lots of different different characteristics of each of the, the rooms on the property. So that's just a short tour of the B&B, &B, but you all really should go there. It's the sweetest little spot, like, like Amanda said, right by Moran State Park. So you have so many options of things to do, um, but maybe you can bring your scones there too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One thing I forgot to, to mention, um, and I did have some of these baked off, so I wanted to show you. You could also take the scone uh, batter and then pour it into a muffin wrapper. I get these tulip papers um, and they're for a larger muffin tin, but you can pour that scone batter into the muffin wrapper and have kind of a muffin scone, a scone and a muffin. Scone. I don't know, you can come up with the name, but, but basically this is another way to make it portable. So I thought I would share that with you for an idea for your creative baking later. Pastries on the go, gotta love that. If there are any further questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or use the chat function right now, or else we are gonna keep this to a half hour and say goodbye and enjoy our scones. <laughs> uh, we have one question about sugar. Yeah. We use organic sugar when we mix uh, when we're mixing the dough versus like the C and H sugar. Does that affect the scone at all? It may a little bit. Um, you know, so in baking, without getting too technical, sugar as you heat it becomes a liquid. 
So you have to, and that's why sometimes if you ever make chocolate chip cookies, for example, which are very sensitive to how much sugar you put into them, they can be kind of flat and, and oozy if you put too much sugar in the recipe. So you may have a little bit of, um, of, of a, a, a different texture, but then again, it's, it's, you know, it's probably minimal, I would think, in the scone recipe, as long as the other ingredients are, for the most part, in line there. But that's a really good question. Thank you. Great. We've got uh, another question from the chat asking, is the dough the same consistency for the muffins? Yeah, yeah. So you would literally, instead of cutting it into those triangles, you would just take a handful, you know, evenly divided if you're making six giant muffins. These are, these are about the same weight as the scone. So you can see um, they're generally about the same size. They only expand slightly, so they're not going to be something that, you know, really rises much more. It'll just get that same scony top on the top of it. But yeah, you would just kind of ball them up and because it's kind of a dense sticky dough, it just kind of goes into the tin, into the uh, wrapper and you don't need to spray the wrappers since there's so much butter in them. Great. I think this final question in the chat is a really great way to wrap things up. Uh, we have a question asking, will you post this recording so we can share with friends? And yes, we are in the process of recording this full baking lesson. And as soon as we uh, close this out, we will start getting it up onto the website. That way you all can watch it again, share it with friends, um, watch the videos and um, visit Orcas Island virtually. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thanks so much for spending your evening with us baking. We hope all the scones turned out as delicious as they smell. And we hope to see you in future virtual vacations and thank you. virtual baking classes. Yes, I encourage you to look at visitsanjuans.com slash saver. Again, we've got another baking, uh, another baking lesson on Wednesday and then a cooking class on Friday. And then two weeks after that, we have a week of wine tastings. So we've got a lot of really fun things in store. And I uh, hope to see some some of you there. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>